Hello. Oh, that one's working. Oh, yeah. Let's try this one. Let's turn this one on. Testing. Now the 12th one. Excellent. It's a miracle! It's a miracle. Okay, go ahead. Are we recording? We are recording. Excellent. We got all of that. Not all of it. Good morning, and welcome to Spiritual Anarchists. Uh, this is just going to be a open discussion, but let me start with a couple definitions. Uh, one is anarchism, a belief in the abolition of all government and the organization of society on a voluntary, cooperative basis without recourse to force or compulsion. And then the definition of spiritual, uh, one, of relating to or affecting the human spirit or soul as opposed to material or physical things, and two, of or relating to religion or religious belief. And so obviously we could have other definitions, but I thought that would be a uh, starting point. Um, and for me, I'll just jump in and say that for me, human spirit has a lot to do with uh, meaning. As humans, we create meaning. We have, can abstract you know, uh, indefinitely. Meaning's very important. So the meanings that I have in, in my life uh, may be profound and I would call those spiritual. That's just kind of like a scratching the surface. Do you have any? I just, uh, one of the reasons I came up with the idea for this, for this talk is because I think a lot of the people who are of a spiritual or religious background or are bringing that to the fest are in a, are in a kind of out of their comfort zone when they come to the fest because, uh, I mean, in the wider population, I mean, religious people are the vast majority and atheists are a tiny minority. And they get disrespected, and they get you know their their opinions aren't taken seriously by some people because they're not religious. And we have the exact opposite situation here at the MPLC sometimes. Is that the atheists are in such a majority, and I don't blame them for getting together and you know being enthusiastic about their beliefs and about you know how how they're unique and different from. They don't get that opportunity. They don't have you know a church to go to to talk about atheism. So this, it's a good it's a good thing for them to be able to get together and talk about. Uh, where they're coming from, but sometimes it excludes some of the people who are religious, and sometimes <laughs> people who are religious get to, you know, ignored or left out for some of the stuff. So I think that that's why I thought this would be a good topic for today. So include everybody. Speaking of which, who wants to to be included with this mic? Any comments? Comments or other questions? Didn't really have anything much prepared for today. Brandon's got something. Okay, so I identify as a Christian anarchist, but that is that, you know, anarchy means no ruler. So that's not really an accurate term for me because I believe that God rules and that only God should rule. And, you know, that human governments are Satan's system of things. And I prefer and am waiting for uh, the the prophecies of Daniel 2.44 to be fulfilled, which is that God is going to come down to earth, destroy all of the earthly governments, all the human governments, cast them off of the earth, and then God's kingdom is going to rule forever. Um, so I wouldn't really call myself, I do call myself an anarchist, but that's, I admit it's not really accurate because I believe that God rules and should rule. So. It's not really no rulers, that's, that's God rules. But that's not like saying that God should rule by way of the state forcing everyone to be Christians or by, you know, anything like that. It's, it's voluntary, okay? So this idea of you either accept Christ or you're going to burn in hell for an eternity of torment, that's not really what I get out of what the Bible says, okay? What I'm getting is that it's a voluntary kingdom, that you can choose that kingdom, and if you don't, then you'll just be destroyed, which means that you're going to die, which if you're an atheist, that's what you believe anyway. So my, my spirituality, my Christianity is, is not a violation of the NAP or any sort of aggressive towards anyone else. I would prefer that everyone choose God's kingdom on their own, but I certainly would never force that onto anyone. I don't think that's the way that uh, God or that Jesus taught us 
taught us to be. So I guess a proper term for me would be a Christian voluntarist. Okay. So, and you know, the whole hell is an eternity of burning torment. I believe that that was a invention of the Catholic Church and that a loving God would never do that. And, you know, we could go into the specifics of that if we want to talk about it, but basically, you know, the word hell is a replacement for, like, a Hebrew word or something, Galhalla or something, which is actually, like, a garbage dump. Or, you know, and so, so, so that's that for now. So no coercion. Yeah, no coercion. All right, awesome. Well, since the Catholic Church came up, and I'm a Catholic, I should probably say something about that. Um, you know, first of all, the thing about being voluntary, that is, you know, when we think about um, the way men are and how they want to rule one, one another, and you think about how God is, God is just totally bizarre and weird from our standpoint. I mean, here you have this being that is all-powerful and can do anything they want, can make anything happen they want, and yet, the most God did was just say, you should do this, or you should do that, and never ever bothered to coerce it, how, how unlike we are. Because if a man wants something done, and he has the power to make it done, it will be done. And if he's telling you what to do, and he has the power to make you do it, you will be made to do it. And if you don't do it, you will be punished for not doing it when it's over with. We make things happen that we want to be done. We mean human beings. And God is like this super laid back dude, you know, who, who says, hey, you know, I'm telling you should do this stuff, and since I made you, you know, I mean, I, I have a right to speak. And, uh, and yet, uh, we put him here on earth, and most of the time, he just leaves us alone. And even then, your, your point about, you know, hell was a good one, although it was not an invention of the Catholic Church. It was, it was coming from the words of Jesus, and you'd be cast into hell in that. And, you know, the images of fire and all that, who knows, in an immaterial world, you don't have flames, you don't have fire, but it, it seems to denote a very unpleasant place. And your point of uh, accepting God in, what, in His life, in the hereafter, would be um, totally voluntary. And there has to be a choice. You, you have to be able to say yes, you have to be able to say no. I mean, that's God's whole shtick. He didn't want, want to make robots. He could make robots that would do anything he wanted. He said, no, you pick. And if you pick me, come on in. If you flip me off and say, I don't want anything to do with you, they go, okay, go. And, uh, you know, I happen to think hell is, uh, is the definition of an eternity without God. And I, I wonder sometimes if maybe uh, we could go on living in this, on this earth and maybe Maybe, maybe living the life of Bill Gates or something, the wealthiest person there is. And if that might not become hell in a hundred years or a thousand years, maybe it would become hell in a billion years. I don't know. But I'm saying you can have this idea of the eternal punishment without ever being punished at all, but simply being made by your own choice. Even if you were given the best possible existence that God could give you, apart from accepting God and and, and and living the, the life that was meant for you. Once you reject that, the perfection is is unavailable, you know, if you rejected it. But that, you know, that's kind of how I see it. And I think that the doctrine of, you know, God casting somebody into hell to burn forever, I mean, it's pretty horrifying how I could reconcile that with a, with a loving and all-powerful God. It doesn't seem right either. But I can certainly reconcile uh, being somewhere else than in heaven with God being perfectly compatible with your free will and you saying, I don't want anything to do with it. And God says, okay. So in the end, you, you say, you say, thy will be done. Or God says to you, no, your, your will be done. And that's what happens. Somebody want to make a comment? Yeah, does anyone want to make a comment? I, I think what Randy had to say was really, was really good. And also, Next year, if we do this group again, and we have to use the quote, uh, God is like this totally laid back dude by Randy England to advertise the, because that, that is priceless. Because 
That is a total, totally laid back dude. So, Randy, I, I have a question for you because Tracy and I were both raised Catholic. Yeah. And we don't really identify as Catholic anymore, primarily because of our anarchism. And a lot of that came about with the continued teachings. It's sad. No, that was me. Uh, Go ahead. Um, the continued teachings of the Catechism that basically promote government. I mean, right in the Catechism, they talk about how like the government should be used to promote the common good and that you are morally responsible to pay your taxes to a just government. And basically that underlying assumption that any government could be just on the face of the earth. And I guess how do you reconcile that? You know, that, that's, that's probably my biggest, biggest problem that I come up against with fellow Catholics is that there's so much support for, for government in that, in, the, in so many of the traditional teachings of the church. I think, you know, there are, you, if you've been, you've been Catholic at some point, you know there are some teachings that are, that are taught widely, and then there are others that are taught, as they say, infallibly. Right. That they are settled, doctrine. settled doctrines and they cannot be changed. The form of government are how men rule themselves or keep the peace among themselves in no way is dictated by the Catholic Church. They would be anything at all. And if you, if you went to the Pope and said, if there was a way that you could have a peaceful uh, community, a peaceful earth without threatening violence, would you be cool with that? Uh, I'm thinking, yeah. That, there, is no, there is no teaching that says you have to have violent government. But there's a heck of a lot of people that think that. And that's the, thing, the hardest thing that I come up with because there's so many, there's so many status in the Catholic Church just like there's status everywhere. It's, it's, a, it's a big problem. But I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't think it's insurmountable. A lot of things that, you know, the churches in their past has had things that I'm not proud of at all that they changed on that were never actual doctrines. The church never said slavery is a good thing. But they, 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 they didn't fight it for probably 1,800 years. They just let it lie, said, slaves, you need to just lie low, protect your masters. I mean, obey your masters, keep quiet, get to heaven, you know. And it took 1,800 years before the church finally, I mean, I'm not saying the Catholic Church, but the Protestant churches were in that same, same time frame thing too. And uh, it took a long time to realize the gravity of that problem and then uh, another one was the uh, religious freedom. I know the Catholic Church, they started out the first 300 years, thought it was horrifying that uh, anyone would use coercion to make anyone to believe, to burn a heretic or something. <clears throat> and then as always happens, any institution, including the church, gets caught up with the government. Where Christianity became legal in the year well, around 312 or, or so. And, uh, Sure enough, you know, crooked guys in, in the church get into government. Crooked guys in the government want to take advantage of the church. And pretty soon, they're using the church to help condemn their enemies. The government is, of course. And this goes on for, for more than a thousand years. And only very recently, in the past hundred years or so, has the Christian churches begun to say this shouldn't happen. I think the last... Uh, I think maybe the last heretic was uh, was executed. It was they're always politically motivated, but they sometimes use that you know their their beliefs for that. Probably about 200 years ago, and I know that like the Catholic Church in in uh, back in the 60s finally reached a point where they formally declared and says you have to have absolute freedom of belief. No one should ever be persecuted for anything they believe, and you, religion just cannot be coerced. Period. Look how long it took. We're changing. That's why I hope for freedom and in my particular uh, church because uh, I think we're moving in that direction and that there are things that take time. There, there are a number of examples you have in the, in the New Testament where uh, Jesus came and said, well, here's the way it should be. And they said, well, that's not what Moses taught me. And Jesus said, your hearts were way too hard. There's no way we could have taught this you know, 1,500 years ago, and I'm telling you now, this is the way it's always supposed to be, and now I think you're ready for it. And I think uh, one day we'll be ready for freedom, too. Or, I just want to piggyback on that for a second. <coughs> I absolutely respect, and I actually buy in on some level with, you know, what you just said. To the original point, though, about catechism, so I'm thinking... 
I'm a mom, so I did not bring my children up in any particular religion. As they got older, we found a spiritual center where I thought they could learn some, you know, some connection and to have some spirituality and, and know something beyond themselves, and they could take that or leave that. But now, if you know, if a young couple decides to have children and they want to pursue a Catholic path for their family, the children, in order to be a part of the church, have to go through the training, the schooling, the catechism, being fed those beliefs, which then as parents you have to almost un-indoctrin the child when they came home each week. I mean, that to me would be a concern. And so maybe there's certain, you know, maybe maybe a Catholic family would then be able to shop around, but um, you know, let, let the market bear. But if if it's something that's being fed into your children, I grew up with lots of friends that were Catholic, and they'd come home and they did this and they had to do this, and I'm like, oh, that seems so weird. <laughs> and I would go to church, you know, and I'd go, oh, they don't get it at all, like, you know, whatever it is, whether it was a Catholic church or you know other churches. And yet, if you don't have that connection and those conversations with your kids, as an adult, you can say, and you can know the history, and you can choose, okay, that's how that was, or that's how that was misconstrued. As children growing up in these religious places, if they're fed it over and over again, and then they develop the friendships, and then they're in their friends' home, all of these things, you know, you almost have to go, you know, step back and say, oh, okay, we can take you know, what we want from this and let go of the rest of it. But I think that that's where some of my friends who are kind of the angry former Catholics kind of come from, is that it was forced that on them and they didn't have that dialogue. It was very much, this is the way it is, and that's it. And so you get that you know, you know, recovering or, or you know, former, whatever it is, when someone says that they were Catholic. And that's so heartbreaking to me. And I didn't grow up in a household like that, so I guess I don't know what that is like. But as a parent, I knew that that was something I didn't want for my kids. And and that's mm -hmm. you know that's kind of the, the crux of it. Just like families who are anarchists may choose to unschool. You know, it's that idea of letting the kids develop those those thoughts and and come to that fruition themselves. Just comment on that. I, guess I, I, I know what you, I know what you mean about the uh, the uh, you know kind of growing up in an oppressive atmosphere. I, I run into people like that, and they're yeah. hostile. I, I never had that. I mean, I never had any kind of pressure when I was a kid, even though I was raised Catholic, and, and I and I actually kind of fell away for a while and then came back on my own. Uh, one thing I should have mentioned about the catechism, though, uh, it's it's not all the way you're suggest saying. There's there are a lot of things that sound kind of pro-government, although they always posit an ideal perfect government. It's like government, you know, should do this, should do that, and, you know, some people give me that, Catholics say that to me, I say, yeah, if you ever found a government, you know, that, well, that you know, I consider it, but there's never been one and there never will be. So it's a false underlying assumption that there exactly. could be one. Exactly, absolutely so why false the assumption. Perfect government is no government. <laughs> well, there, there's, well, there's a line for you in the catechism, and, and in the catechism there's a line that says, says that the fact that a government needs to use violence to get compliance from its subjects in and of itself is proof that it is unjust. And you, you parse that out, and that's like, there is no government. There is no government worthy of being followed on the face of the earth. It's like I buy that totally. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, we're still sorting it out. So I, I, don't, I don't want to just make excuses for the church because they, a lot of Catholics have a lot to, long way to go on that. I, I'm sure I do too. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to respond back to the, um, uh, the exact same sentiments I have. Uh, I've got three little girls, and uh, they're, they're going to a uh, church uh, preschool, and um, I'm very much, I'll just put this out there in the open, I'm, I'm a, uh, say a hardcore, lowercase Lutheran. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not uh, following the Catholic Church, I'm part of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, that's the closest uh, um, doctrine that uh, I really relate to. But uh, you know, when it comes to raising kids, I, I've you know, slowly learned, uh, you know, my oldest is almost four, 
is that you, you do have to make calls for them in their in their best interest, right? They uh, they go out for lunch and they're like, well, what do you want? Well, of course they want French fries and ketchup. And when I mean ketchup, they literally want a spoon and they just want to eat ketchup. And I can say, well, just do what you want. You know, you're free, you're free spirited little human beings, and they are. Um, and I can say, do what you want, or I can say, no, we're not going to have ketchup because you do that over 18, 20 years, you're going to grow up and you're going to have diabetes, you're going to have, you know, problems you're not going to want to eat, you know, your vegetables. Now, if I, if I turn this around and say, you must only eat, you know, the healthiest foods and um, don't even think about enjoying other things and, and make it a very strict forced environment, they're going to, they're going to grow up and they're, they're going to be damaged by that because they truly are free being, uh, free beings. There's nothing inherently wrong with ketchup, with, you know, cookies, uh, all, all those types of things. So, it's been tough for me to try to let them be free but not be little monsters um, and to let their true nature grow. Um, for me, I'm a controls engineer, so, so the biggest thing I, I try to get them to do is to get the feedback from their own mistakes um, as, as much as I can because that, that's how we learn. That's how we learn that, yeah, we're free, spirited little people, but um, we mess up all the time. It's like even the things that we want to do. Uh, we somehow don't get those things done, uh, or we, you know, do things that uh, we we would rather not do. Of course, that's written in the Bible, but that's just kind of common sense, right? How you many times when we're, you know, uh, older teenagers, young twenties, you know, wake up with a massive headache and be like, oh man, you know, I, I was just doing what I wanted to do last night. It was so much fun, and uh, you do that a couple times, and uh, you, you just learn. You know, from that experience, that you know, sometimes you can't just follow what your immediate need tells you what you want to do. Um, back to the issue of government, though, and and what what it says about the Bible about you know honoring government, and, and that's the basic question I want to pose for everyone. Maybe as a uh, kind of a theme, I, I don't want to take over the whole discussion, but just a a theme of, of many things is you know what is authority. What is authority? It is not an intrinsic property. We can't go around and measure something's authority. Um, and it, it's very much in line with the value. That is, that it, it is in the eye of the beholder. Authority is in the eye of the beholder. If you fear something to the point where you believe that that is the ultimate authority, the ultimate most authority in your um, in your world, you know, guys in black suits, you know, with guns knocking at my door. That is the most immediate fear that I have. That is unfortunately the authority. Um, maybe it's not though. Maybe there is a greater fear that we, um, you know, we could remember at, at times. And uh, yeah, I just want to. Um, I'm gonna bust out the Bible real quick, not to do a Bible study, but um, you know, Luke kind of shows how Jesus comes into the world, and this is included. Um, you know, it was not omitted. This is not just like tabloid of the day, but it says, uh, in those days, the decree went out from Caesar Augustus, right? That was uh, the world empire, that the whole empire or the whole world should be registered. Um, this is, of course, to prepare the way for the world's system of taxes. Uh, this first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria, so everyone went to be registered, each to his uh, hometown. Joseph also went to blah, 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 you know, Galilee with Mary, and uh, that is where the environment that Jesus was born into. And I don't think um, that was left out of Luke's account. Um, uh, I think that was purposely included. Uh, Matthew was also a tax collector, and uh, the Pharisees, who were the religious elite of the nation state of Judah, that's what the, the Judeans or the Jews were called, that, that really was a nation state, they were building up a kingdom, um, and then they had this, you know, they had all these great prophets and miracles backing up their history saying, oh, well, we, we have the, the, bless, the divine blessing from God, we're God's name, uh, chosen people, and they were turning this into this massive nation state, of course it was struggling, it was competing with other kingdoms, and uh, then there was this guy, uh, Pontius Pilate, you know, coming from Rome, uh, imposing the, the Roman Empire on them. So they were, uh, and then all of a sudden Jesus comes in and he's like pulling the rug out from underneath their feet. Hey, we're working on this big state, and this Jesus guy he keeps criticizing us, and he's pulling the people away from us with his positive message. Uh, the Pharisees uh, went to trap Jesus uh, in what he said. They sent 
their disciples with him, with the Herodians. Now, this is a different king. So they, they're, they're kind of, you know, divided. We can maybe beat their combined. Uh, we can maybe beat this guy. Uh, teacher, they said, we know that you are truthful and teach truthfully the way of God. Now they're building him up. Uh, you defer to no one, for you don't show partiality. And they're really trying to elevate him up here. Tell us, therefore, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Right? And most, I bring this up because uh, most Christians don't understand what this is. I, I'm going to be frank. We, we read this, we know the, the scripture, but we don't really know what Jesus is saying, and we don't admit that openly. Um, uh, perceiving their malice, Jesus said, Why are you testing me, hypocrites? Right, he, he he knows that uh, he knows what's in their hearts, and and you know we know that as well. Uh, show me the coin used for the tax, and he goes straight to, to you know to what I think you know von Mises and um, Rothbard, you know spent decades going to is like hey you know money is is a product, it is an idea, it is a um, is a brand image, and he you know he knows that right off the bat. So they brought him. Uh, a denarius, the coin, and he says, whose image and whose inscription is on this? He asked them, Caesar's, they said. Then he said to them, therefore, give back to Caesar the things of Caesar and give to God the things of God. He's saying, if you're truly trying to create, you know, this, you know, beautiful people of God devoted to the truth and to their creator and trying to do the right thing, and you're not trying to create your own nation state and fend off other competing nation states, uh, then you should just give to God what is God's, and you should not worry about you know Caesar's kingdom. Um, this is this is not a fair comparison. If what the uh, the Judeans believed to be true was that they were the people of God, they were far and above Caesar. Caesar is not comparable to God. It's, it's, it's a false question um, in, in a sense. Yet Jesus poses it to them so that they can make that decision. They can decide themselves. Well, what did what do they really fear more? Do they fear this idea of, of um, God, the creator and Lord of the whole universe, who is trying to communicate and foster its people? Or are they going to fear uh, this great empire that seems to be, by all accounts, the most, um, you know, the greatest thing they've ever seen? And, and really, he, 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 Jesus turned the tables on them and said, you know, your heart, you're a free people. You can choose what you want to fear most. You can, you can either fear uh, uh, an earthly authority governed by mortal, sinful men. That's, Caesar, that's what Caesar was, right? How could he be compared to God? Um, or, you know, fear the things of God. A choice of whom to serve. <laughs> a choice, absolutely. We, we have that choice, and, and that choice is not going to be taken away. Because as he said, if that choice was taken away, if we were forced to follow Satan, if we were forced to follow God and to give praise to God, that would not be a true, a true reflection of, of His life. You know, returning to Him, that would be uh, uh, that would really put God in the position of Satan if He did that. It would be a contrived, false world. And so, yeah, we always have that choice. <coughs> I have a uh, question. We've been talking about Christianity, but I'm wondering, are there people here who call themselves spiritual in whatever that means as an individual thing who are not Christian? And would you like to talk about it? <laughs> Questions here? Yeah. Sure, I got to do it a little bit in one of the discussions yesterday. I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness. Um, so I uh, feel like I've studied the Bible inside and out, back and forth, and uh, I definitely had a crisis of faith, and in the end, I'm an atheist. Uh, however, spirituality, I feel, is still something that's important, because I feel that word is very closely aligned to our emotional states, and I feel like, it, at least for me, it's hard to see spirituality without emotion or emotion without spirituality. Um, there are definitely many would argue and I would agree there's an intellectual component. You would need to have some intellectual understanding of, of what you feel you're experiencing. Um, but emotions are a strong component of that. And so I guess for me in, in a secular life, 
the word spiritual is, is really vague. I mean, it means a different thing to almost everybody, especially when it comes to their own personal experiences of what they would call spiritual. Um, it's really hard to put them in definition. So the term that I'm a little more comfortable with maybe is transcendence. Is that feeling of, of a human sort of becoming part of something greater than itself, and that could just be an experience of a place in the sense that there have been other humans and other beings in that same space across time. Um, there's, there's, I guess, hundreds or thousands of transcendent experiences we could have every single day that would give us um, a sense of spiritual connection with our surroundings or with other people. Um, and I think a book that uh, sort of brought me back to reconsidering spirituality as secular practice even uh, is a book that Sam Harris wrote called Waking Up. And he is, I guess, trying to reach the skeptic atheist community a little bit in the sense that you might have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. That life isn't all about living in your head and just intellect and arguments and debating. Um, there's, you're missing half of the human experience if that's just what you want to live in. Um, so I'm, I'm here mostly just to hear other people's thoughts, but I, that's sort of where I'm at right now. Thank you. Um, I know for me, when I hear atheists criticize uh, religious texts, um, they often approach it from a scientific perspective. And they say, you know, scientifically this cannot be proven, so they reject uh, that information. Uh, and for me, kind of the analogy I use, if I go to an art museum and I see an impressionistic painting that is not realistic, you know, it still can have meaning and value for me. It can evoke emotions. Um, it can be, you know, again, it can be meaningful, but it is not a realistic uh, uh, representation of what the artist was looking at when he or she created that uh, painting or work of art. Um, so, and then the other thing, uh, one of the influences in my life has been uh, general semantics, which was uh, developed by back in the 20s and 30s by uh, Alfred Korzybski. And one of his ideas, he's the one who came up with the, the expression, the map is not the territory, in terms of looking at abstractions and, and being conscious of those abstractions. One of his ideas, he divided life into uh, chemistry binders, which are plants, they can uh, store energy and chemicals. Space binders, which are animals, they can do what plants can do, but they have an awareness of space around them, they have territory. And time binders, which are humans, we can, we have awareness of space, we store energy chemically, but we have the ability to pass on from one generation to the next the experience that we, that we have, the knowledge that we gain. So we're able to, to do that. And that I see as a very spiritual thing. Um, being able to get information from you know, books and other resources from past experience and then apply that in my life and pass that on. Uh, and a lot of that experience is experience on like how to live a good life. How, you know, and so that is very much a spiritual thing. And I believe that from different religious texts there is value that I can draw. And it's not, it's not an either or kind of, uh, kind of thing. So that's, I take it that way. Any, uh, any comments in general? All right, so I'm not going to read the Bible at all. I'm going to talk about controls theory because um, it's a little more scientific. But uh, in, 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 uh, in controls theory, we uh, say we're doing a, a vehicle uh, cruise control or setting the speed. We create some type of a reference point, right? The driver says, I want to, you know, 60 miles an hour, or 70 miles an hour, whatever. And then uh, the, the vehicle looks um, in real time at the current state and makes, you know, adjustments to whatever actuators it can to try to keep what it's seeing in the feedback path close to that reference point. And then, it, and I've realized that humans are, you know, just amazing control systems. We perceive things. We have sensors. We, we receive information uh, from our little babies, even you know, in the womb. You know, we're receiving information, and that's processing. We're building up a, an algorithm in our mind, and then we.
process the logic, and then we create help as we have actuators in our hands and our feet, and we try to change something in the world so that when we see uh, the world, you know, either immediately or the next day or the next year, or whatever, we try to see that that change that we um, originally wanted. And so I see spirituality as as reaching out to the higher and higher and higher levels of what it is that we create as, as an objective input, right? Because otherwise. If we don't, somebody else is going to say, this is what you're supposed to do. This is a definition of success. This is a definition of happiness. You need to just go with the flow. And spirituality is that type of breaking free, I think, and really deciding for yourself, this is what I think is truly, you know, the best, greatest thing I can accomplish, you know, up at higher and higher levels of abstraction. Yeah, maybe it could be, um, you know, creating a company over a decade. Maybe it could be raising kids over two decades. Maybe it could be, um, you know, promoting some thought and writing things down. It's going to last for years and years. Maybe it's exhibiting some type of way of, of life, of proving, you know, agorism and peacefulness and all that uh, works, right? We can pick higher and higher levels of abstraction of how we want to um, define that. To me, that's, that's what I, I see as spirituality, is climbing that ladder leaving the, the, oh, this is what everyone else is doing, this is what I'm supposed to do, this is what I was taught, I'm just going to, you know, go for that, I'm going to get my high GPA, get a degree, get a job, work my way up the ladder, get a 401k, and bada bang, I'm set. Right, that's pretty low level objective setting, um, but it's very common, I think very unspiritual uh, today. Yeah, that's, I, I agree with that. That's, um, again, I think it has to get to meaning. What meaning do you have uh, in your life? Uh, and, and what do you want to accomplish with that? Any other thoughts from? So being a Christian in, in, uh, in the middle of a bunch of anarchists who are mostly atheists, um, our tactics are kind of a little bit different. Okay, uh, a lot of people talk about how we can, you know, abolish the state and how we can achieve a free society or a free world without government. And I'm just over here waiting for Daniel 244 to come true. You know, so my tactics are a little bit different in the way that I don't respect the state or I don't view the state as a legitimate authority over me. I'm no longer really like trying to battle the state in the way that I want to abolish it because you know that's not going to happen. I believe in the Bible and the way the the book is written in the Bible is that that's God's going to do that, uh, not me. So you know I promote agorism and all this. You know not using the Caesar as God coin. You know as much as we can. I mean unfortunately, kind of have to, but you know I try to do as much as I can on the black market or I try to change people's mind and get people to free, become free in their own mind where they don't believe that these human governments actually have legitimate authority over them. But I'm just I'm making the point that as a Christian, my tactics um, are, are different than an atheist's anarchist tactics because they maybe are trying to find out ways to actually abolish the state and I'm just over here waiting for Daniel 244 to happen. Well don't you think that just sitting around waiting is, is not going to happen? I mean when, when if you think God is going to abolish the state, do you think it's going to be a bolt from the blue or do you think he's going to be doing it through the people involved with the state? I mean. No, I think it's actually God who's going to do it. Like, literally, like, Jesus is going to come down here and kick all their asses. So you're just waiting for a miracle. You're not trying to bring the miracle about no, uh, well, the world life? I think that the way to bring the miracle about is to preach, is to teach as many people as possible the truth about God's kingdom. The truth that, that, the truth that hell is not an eternity of torment. You know, the truth that God's kingdom is voluntary and he wants you to choose it on your own. And I think that um, because, see, um, if you go back to Genesis, Satan told 
the first people of mankind, which is Adam and Eve, told them, you know, if you eat from the tree of knowledge, you're not really going to die. And that was a challenge to God. You probably heard this before. That was a challenge of God to God. That was Satan saying, God is not a good ruler. He's lying to you. You won't really die if you eat the forbidden fruit. And, you know, you should just do that and, and whatever. Well, so they disobeyed. And then we inherited that, that um, trait from Adam and Eve because we're all their descendants. So we inherited that sin and that kind of turning away from God. But my point is that um, that's why we're still stuck here on earth, okay? Because if God would have just said, okay, whatever, then I'm going to, you know, wipe out Adam and Eve and since they disobeyed me and that's it. No, God left them here and God said, you know, um, we're here to, to prove that we do need governance, but we need it from God, not from humans. So here we are being ruled by ourselves in the way that we're being ruled by mankind and to learn that yes, God was right, Satan was telling us a lie, and we really do need to be ruled by God and not by men. Because I think the whole power vacuum argument that we often hear from state is, oh, well, well we can't have, uh, Anarchy, because if we do, then my system might return, you know, because another authority would come fill the power vacuum. Well, I kind of believe that. I mean, you see it, you know, if there's, a, I heard one guy talking last night about how if we didn't have a state, then insurance companies would be the state, because in order for you to work, you would have to not do cocaine, because your insurance company would require that for you to be insured, you have to pass a drug test, and this other company isn't going to hire you to contract for them if you're not insured. So, you know, there's all different sorts of ways of people imposing what they want on other people. And I do believe there would be a power vacuum. And, you know, if we abolish a state, another one's going to come along in some form or another. And so that's why, that's why we're going through this to, to hopefully, so everyone will learn that yeah, that this being ruled by ourselves sucks and we do need, you know, the creator of all things to actually, we should submit to his kingdom voluntarily because that's gonna be the best thing for us, you know? So like freedom, a lot of people, you know, what a lot of people think freedom is, I don't know, um, like uh, let me give you an example. If we had total capitalist freedom, right? And, and, and my grandparents saved up more money and your grandparents were, you know, drunkards. And, and so I have more money in my family and I'm able to buy more land and I'm able to use my economic advantage to take advantage of more people. And then next thing you know, I own all the land and I'm the land lord. And therefore I'm ruling you all because if you want to live, you have to pay me to live on my land and I own it all, right? Well, not a lot of people know about... Um, Everybody knows about the Sabbath, okay? This The seventh day of the week is a Sabbath, and we're supposed to use that day to, uh, or at least in the Jewish law, um, to to uh, rest and all this, right? And, and to spend time with God or whatever. And There's also another Sabbath of every seven years, you were supposed to not grow any crops. And you're supposed to just let whatever grows, grows, and store food from the last year, and let the land kind of rest and rejuvenate and there's also another sabbath that was every like seven sets of seven years and there's no account in the bible of anyone ever following this but um every seven sets of seven years all debts are supposed to go back to zero and whatever your land was uh, if you had made some mistakes and you went out and partied rather than taking care of your flock of sheep and you lost all your livestock, and so then you had to go become an indentured servant to someone else, or you had to sell your land or whatever. Well, every time this uh, seven sets of seven years Sabbath would come along, that you would get your land back, okay? And all debts would go back to zero reset. Well, that would kind of fix the problem of people becoming landlords and buying up all the land and then ruling us all because they own all land. So, you know, this, so, I think that 
I think that we need that that all knowing, all powerful ruler to you know make sure that everything is set. So it's, it sounds to me like what you're saying is that uh, you don't think mankind can abolish the state, that it can only be done by God. That is that basically the gist of what you're saying? You know, completely worldwide, yeah. I mean, but, we, could, we could get all our AK-47s right here and say we're all free and individuals and anybody who comes here and tries to press against us and we would, for that moment, we would be free and stateless. Right, but you don't think it's, it, it can right. be maintained, so like you were talking about the power vacuum, so you think that uh, the only way we can keep a stateless society is we, we can't do that without God's help, is what you're saying? Right, well, yeah, in a way. No shame in the place. So, is this on? Yeah? No. No. There it is. Okay, so for me, well, God doesn't want me to talk. There we go. Uh, so for me, I, I would like to see an evolution with people really just up and down. This is the only way this thing works. No. Let's just swap mics. Okay. So, for me, freedom can only truly come once hearts and minds get to this place, right? Because I do believe if everything just disappeared tomorrow, right? And we see this in popular culture, so I think people, either the media is feeding this or culturally or on some bigger scale, people are getting ready for this. We see the apocalyptic, zombie, you know, whatever, the movies, all of these things. So people have this craving for getting rid of their daily societal constraints, right? The government, the, the nine to five, whatever it is. People are drawn to these things. This is becoming, you know, super popular. But the idea is that, yeah, somebody might become then the new rogue faction and take over and start ruling and controlling. That's what we see over and over again, and that's what I think we would all agree would probably happen if just tomorrow we woke up, there's no government anywhere. People are going to get a whole bunch of guns, and people are going to be in charge, and they're going to take over, and some people will fight that, and whatever. But there'll be that power vacuum, and someone will fill it. But I think that evolutionary, we're at a place, and as Randy was saying earlier, there are things, I think it was you, in the Bible where these were the rules, this is what people could have understood at that time. Jesus came and said, hey, you know, that's, that's where we were, but God's really a very laid back dude. <laughs> and you guys can understand that now. And then I see where we are today, and, we, and I see in popular society, people are becoming more aware. They don't need to have the constraint of organized religion. They don't feel that need, okay? Whether they choose to, that's absolutely fine and awesome. I'm cool with anyone assembling in any way they want, believing whatever they want. However, I see the hearts and minds are starting to open up to the idea of we have our own internal barometer. So if that's a God-like presence, or if it's just science, or if it's just human nature, quote unquote, right? Little kids know when they've done something wrong to someone else. They get an upset tummy. You lay awake at night and are not able to sleep. You know, these things, they're already there. You don't necessarily need someone telling you that was a bad idea or you probably shouldn't do that. You either have your own internal barometer, and some people are perhaps flawed, <laughs> and their, their, their temperature is a little different than others. But overall, I don't see that we're going to need to have either an all-powerful personified God telling us what to do, or another human. I believe that voluntary interaction is absolutely possible. Is it possible today? In a small scale, absolutely. Large scale globally, not yet. But in small interactions, if you just keep connecting, and you truly become free yourself, whether that's through your family interactions, you know, no longer choosing to be guilted into something. Choosing to communicate your own needs. You know, that's huge. People, we need things like NBC, whether it's NBC or something else. Those are huge tools to help us escape the paradigm that we live in every single day. 
and to step beyond it and choose to maybe live off of the land more and not use Caesar's fiat, right? What I got out of this is that God loves cryptocurrency. <laughs> You know, so I, I think that those things are, are there, and, and it's possible. When you look at a newborn baby, there's awe, because here's this perfect creature, absolutely here, right? No indoctrination yet, right? They've absorbed, they you know, have, you know, through epigenetics, we learn that there's these awesome things that take place inside our mitochondria and our DNA. That's very cool. So there are things that are passed along. But we have this ability to, we, we don't have to indoctrinate with the state, you know. We, we can step away from that and open up our hearts and minds. Kyle, did you have something? And then this will probably be the last comment where it's almost time for Jason Tracy's game. The thought is passed. So the thought is passed, all right. <laughs> all right, well, thanks everybody for coming out. This was Spiritual Anarchism, and in about five minutes, we're going to be starting Jason and Tracy's canning demonstration. Mostly Tracy. Yeah. Mostly Tracy. <laughs> Yeah. Cool. Thank right. everybody. I'm like